In this lecture, we will discuss some of the important organometallic reactions which deal with carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is probably one of the most important raw materials that is available to the chemist and it is important that we have some means of converting it into useful chemicals. And because of the small polarity of carbon monoxide, it is not possible to carry out reactions with carbon monoxide which you can do with carbon dioxide. So, how is carbon monoxide which is unreactive activated? If you look at the industrial scene, it is clear that there are several reactions such as the water gas shift reaction, the synthesis of acetic acid or even dimethyl carbonate which is extensively used in CDs in the manufacture of CDs for example. All of these utilize carbon monoxide as a raw material. So, how exactly does organometallic chemistry succeed in inactivate or deactivating? How exactly does organometallic chemistry succeed in activating this unreactive molecule? If you look at the chemistry that has been developed, you will realize that carbon monoxide has an extensive chemistry that includes alkyl group, aryl groups, alkynes, alkenes and a combination of all of these groups to form useful materials. So, we will consider each one of these initially separately and then we will look at some complicated reactions where multiple groups are involved. So, in all of these reactions, carbon monoxide is activated and it is it is made possible for a reaction between the unreactive carbon monoxide which is now coordinated to the metal and an alkyl group or an aryl group or a vinyl or allyl group. So, let us take up the first reaction which is probably one of the simplest reactions that is available in this series of uh, chemistry and that belongs to the carbonylation of methanol. This chemistry is that of the carbonylation of methanol, where methanol is reacted with carbon monoxide to generate acetic acid. Now, it turns out that if you heat the two under very high pressures, you will not get acetic acid by any means. But the presence of rhodium iodide and methyl iodide as a catalyst, these two are used in catalytic quantities and that is the uh, molar ratios in which you have to do the reaction. So, it is extremely small amounts of rhodium iodide and methyl iodide that are necessary to push the reaction from the left to the right. And why use rhodium iodide? Can we use rhodium chloride or the bromide? The answer is no. Actually, it has been shown that HI is essential for driving the reaction from the left to the right. Now, this is uh, strange until you consider the fact that HI actually converts methanol into methyl iodide and that is this reaction that we are talking about right here, which undergoes a simple insertion reaction of methyl iodide with carbon monoxide to give you acetyl iodide. And if you add up all three reactions, the hydrolysis of acetyl iodide to give you acetic acid and the two reactions that we just talked about, you will you will come to the conclusion that you just need to add methanol and carbon monoxide to get acetic acid. So, it turns out that although you need methyl iodide in catalytic quantities and rhodium iodide also, this reaction is an extremely profitable reaction where you have taken two rather unreactive species and converted them into acetic acid which is such a useful raw material in the industry. Now, let us take a look at the science behind this whole process. Why do we need methyl iodide? Methyl iodide is the one which will undergo this first step in this reaction where the rhodium diiodo rhodium carbonylate species which I am marking for you right here. The one 
that undergoes oxidative addition. You will notice that this is a D8 species and it has got a nice filled d orbital that is in the d z squared along the z axis in the d z squared orbital and that is perpendicular to the plane in which the ligands are kept. Now, that carries out a nucleophilic substitution reaction on methyl iodide. So, you need a fairly good leaving group for the iodo group to leave from the methyl uh, species. So, that you can achieve this 6 coordinated compound which is now D 6 and it is octahedral in nature and you have a rhodium 1 compound being converted to rhodium 3 because you have undergone oxidative addition. This is an oxidative addition reaction and it is now set up to carry out the next step which is the insertion of carbon monoxide. Now, as we mentioned in the studies in insertion reactions, it is the methyl group which migrates to the carbon monoxide. So, it the methyl group migrates to the carbon monoxide. So, that you have an acetyl group coordinated to the rhodium. Now, this whole step is in fact an equilibrium process. This keeps oscillating back and forth, but if you have excess pressure of carbon monoxide, you can drive the reaction to uh, the to the left side of this catalytic cycle. So, much so that you will end up with this compound in solution, which now reductively eliminates. So, it undergoes a reductive elimination. This is a rhodium 3 species and that undergoes reductive elimination to give you the catalytically active RHI 2 CO 2 minus species which is the resting state of the catalyst. This is the resting state of the catalyst and uh, acetyl iodide is eliminated in the reductive elimination step. So, as we saw earlier acetyl iodide will be now converted to hydroiodic acid and acetic acid and the hydroiodic acid is capable of converting the methanol to methyl iodide which we have pictured here. So, essentially we have converted methanol to acetic acid. So, this is this step that we have just considered this catalytic cycle that we have just considered is the simplest of the carbonylation reactions that we would consider today. In there is only one oxidative addition and there is an insertion process and a reductive elimination. So, this is an extremely simple catalytic cycle. Now, we will consider a more complex situation where there are two key steps in the whole reaction and that is the hydroformylation reaction. You will realize that the previous reaction that we discussed was, was primarily developed by this company Monsanto and now we are talking about another chemical company called Ruhr Chemie which developed this hydroformylation reaction. The person who was primarily responsible for this famous discovery was Otto Rolin and he did this as early as 1938. So, you can see that this is long before the renaissance that took place in organometallic chemistry, the discovery of ferrocene which happened in 1956. But this reaction is an extremely useful reaction because it converts alkenes in the presence of hydrogen and carbon monoxide to very useful aldehydes. Now, it is possible for this reaction to give you an isomer and we have illustrated this in the second equation that we have written. We have written the hydroformylation of propylene with hydrogen and carbon monoxide that gives you the normal aldehyde that is the butyraldehyde and the isobutyraldehyde which is the isomer which would be formed if the hydrogen adds on to the terminal carbon and that becomes CH 3 if CH this terminal CH 2 becomes CH 3 and the CHO group the carbon monoxide is added to the middle carbon in the propene. So, this turns out to be a complication and in fact, the main advantage or the main improvements that have been done in this reaction 
is the improvement in the selectivity of this whole process. Now, Rowland used dicobalt octacarbonyl as a catalyst. It turns out to be a very efficient catalyst if you use it at these high temperatures 120 and 170 degrees and with a fairly high pressure of carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So, you will realize that in many of these chemistries that we are going to talk about today, you have to use high pressure of carbon monoxide in order to drive the equilibrium to the right and make the whole situation very favorable and fast. Now, it turns out that this olefin hydroformylation reaction underwent a significant improvement in 1976 and that is the time when union carbide used introduced a catalyst which was based on rhodium. The catalyst that was used by Otto Rowland was on cobalt and that would have given him HCOCO4. So, the uh, catalyst that was used by him was identical to this species except for the ligands and the metal have been changed. The oxidation state and the electron count are the same for these two complexes. So, HRHCO2 PPH3 twice was a catalyst that was used by union carbide and in fact, they used molten PPH3, PPH3 above the melting point of uh, the compound was used in the reaction medium and they found that they could convert the propene to normal butyraldehyde in very good yield. Now, you know that cobalt is 1000 times cheaper and so one has to ask the question, why would you use rhodium which is so much more expensive? And the answer of course, is the fact that rhodium is 1000 times more effective and so it turns out to be more economical in the long run to use rhodium rather than cobalt. The temperatures and pressures are again very high and uh, they have to be kept high in order to drive the reaction to the right. I will write a catalytic cycle now which is based on rhodium, but a analogous reaction with cobalt can be very easily written. The resting state is again a rhodium 1 compound. Here, we have written a rhodium 1 species as the resting state of the catalyst and the reaction starts with coordination of an olefin to this D8 species. Now, we form a coordinatively saturated a D10 uh, alkene complex uh, and sorry, that is a D8 alkene complex and now you have a hydrogen cis next right next to an alkene and the alkene would coordinate in such a way that the bulky group will indicate that with so the bulky group in fact coordinates closer to the hydrogen so th that would be the preferred way of coordinating the alkene and the alkene now undergoes a uh, insertion reaction. The negatively charged or the formally negatively charged species migrates on to the neutral, neutral ligand in such a way that you have now an alkyl rhodium 1 compound. So, you had a hydrido alkene complex and after the migration of the hydride, you now have an alkyl complex. This again is a rhodium 1 species. So, we have just carried out during the course of this one step a migration reaction which does not change the oxidation state of rhodium. Now, you, you can in the next step carry out a carbonylation reaction. So, we can add a carbon monoxide to this species to this rhodium 1 alkyl molecule we can add a carbon monoxide and that gives us a penta coordinate rhodium 1 species which can undergo migratory insertion reaction again. Now, the anionic group is this alkyl group here. So, this alkyl group migrates on to the carbon monoxide and as a result of this migration, so 
So, now you have an acyl complex. So, you have an acyl complex and with a vacant coordination site right here, a vacant coordination site right here and we also have as a uh, result of this migration, we have uh, we have this acyl group and this can add on hydrogen to have an oxidative addition reaction. So, this is the oxidative addition reaction and that happens right here and with oxidative addition of hydrogen, you would end up adding two groups in a cis position and this results in the formation of a dihydride that is the final step in this catalytic cycle. You have a dihydride and an acyl moiety and these the acyl moiety is cis to the hydrogen and so now you can eliminate this aldehyde. This aldehyde can be eliminated and that is what is coming out in the catalytic cycle right there to regenerate the catalytically active species which is a rhodium 1 complex. So, this is a reductive elimination step. So, very often a reductive elimination step is the final step in the reaction where your catalytically active species is regenerated. After the regeneration of the catalyst, you might have either an oxidative addition or you might have a simple substitution reaction. In this catalytic cycle, the oxidative addition and the reductive elimination have happened in the very last two steps. So, a similar catalytic cycle can be written for cobalt. Only difference would be the fact that HCOCO4 would be the catalyst instead of the hydrido rhodium species that we have written right here. Otherwise, all the steps would be extremely similar. Now, the hydroformylation reaction is something that is being actively pursued because it gives us a convenient entry into aldehydes and this has to be done very selectively. And also one should note that rhodium is a very expensive metal and so one normally recovers the rhodium, tries to recover the rhodium after the, after the reaction and this turns out to be an expensive process also. So, we should also avoid contamination of the product with the catalyst in this case rhodium and it has been said that in some of the uh, expensive catalysts uh, that have been used, early processes were so inefficient that the concentration of the catalyst in the product was greater than the concentration of the metal in the ore from which it was initially synthesized. So, this has to be prevented and one has to have efficient means of recovering the catalyst. So, hydroformylation in water was one possible solution to this whole difficulty and the company Rhone Polenc was a French company which discovered a water soluble rhodium catalyst. Once again, the catalyst was the rhodium 1 species which is the D 8 species which uh, has been described earlier. So, the mechanism of the reaction would be identical except that by introduction of the SO 3 H group, the SO 3 H group makes the phosphine water soluble and in turn the phosphine coordinated to the rhodium makes the catalyst water soluble. This is a catalyst which is quite popular and has been abbreviated as TPPTS and it is pictured here. It has got 3 SO 3 H groups which make the compound extremely water soluble and it is usually kept as a sodium salt. The separation of the catalyst is easy because one only has to remove the aldehyde which is usually uh, organic compound soluble in organic solvents and so it can be extracted and the water containing the catalyst can be recycled. So, hydroformylation in water is one of the means by which one can carry out the reaction efficiently and at the same time save the catalyst and use it for the next step of the reaction. So, 
in in all these cases you notice that the anionic substrate is the one that adds on to the neutral substrate. In this case, the neutral substrate is carbon monoxide. It is also possible to carry out the reaction in such a way that a second neutral substrate is also added and then subsequently a reductive elimination is carried out. So, multiple insertions can happen in the catalytic cycle. Uh, example of such a reaction is the Repe reaction. Walter Repe again working in a German company uh, called BASF, which is still around and is an extremely old company, which used to manufacture aniline and uh, soda, soda ash. And these, these chemicals are bulk chemicals, which are used in the chemical industry in very large amounts. They discovered some very interesting chemistry, which went along with acetylene, carbon monoxide and water. You will notice that essentially a molecule of water and carbon monoxide have been added to acetylene in order to generate this very useful acid. So, uh, the reaction was carried out again under um, um, high pressure of carbon monoxide, but notice because you are using acetylene, this reaction was a great technical challenge to compress acetylene without an explosion was in fact a difficult uh, task to accomplish. It is to the credit of Walter Repe, who discovered ways and means of handling acetylene, so that it would not explode even when it was pressurized and used in this particular reaction. So, he used it at high temperature at 180 degrees in the presence of nickel bromide and cuprous iodide as catalyst, he was able to convert acetylene to acrylic acid. And in the presence of an alcohol instead of water, you can directly convert it into the ester. So, you can either make the ester or the acid depending on whether you use water or an alcohol. So, these reactions were carried out primarily with nickel as a catalyst and copper iodide was just a promoter that was added. And if you do the reaction at a higher pressure of carbon monoxide, slightly higher pressure of carbon monoxide, then the same reaction would undergo a second addition of uh, carbon monoxide and water to this acrylic acid and generate this saturated dye acid. So, you can see that the reaction can be an extremely versatile and extremely useful reaction, where you can convert acetylene, which is again available in bulk quantities to useful organic compounds, which are required in the industry for the synthesis of uh, drugs and pharmaceut pharmaceuticals and dye stuffs and so on. So, how exactly does this reaction work? Here is a possible scheme that we have written with nickel and a same reaction scheme can be written for the second step also. Only the first step is shown here and that too with nickel tetracarbonyl. Nickel tetracarbonyl can lose two molecules of carbon monoxide and undergo oxidative addition to give you this nickel 2 complex. Here nickel is in the oxidation state of plus 2 and you have a hydrido nickel um, uh, compound, which has got this X group, which is a group that has to be uh, added. In this particular case, you would have to have O R, X is O R or it could be O H if you are using water in the reaction medium. So, if you end up having this nickel 2 plus complex, which can then coordinate to acetylene. So, the next step is of course, coordination of an acetylene molecule and that is what we have here. So, you have an acetylene molecule coordinated to the nickel and you have a hydrogen next to the uh, on the nickel next to the acetylene, you can have an insertion reaction. This insertion reaction would give you a vinyl nickel species and that is 
shown here a vinyl nickel species where the hydrogen in the cis position has migrated onto the acetylene and that gives you again a nickel 2 species, but now the nickel 2 species can um, ha has carbon monoxide which to which it can migrate to and so, so you have a migration of this vinyl group. The vinyl group migrates onto the carbon monoxide which is in the cis position and that gives you the acyl moiety which is pictured here. The acyl moiety can now do a reductive elimination of the two groups the X group and the acyl moiety to give you the product. So, this is your product and this step is your reductive elimination. That gives you back nickel 0 which has got only 2 carbon monoxides and if it oxidatively adds H x which in this particular case it would be the R O H. So, if you start with nickel bromide you can also think of adding the B R and the final step you would have a hydrolysis reaction or an alcoholysis reaction. So, because you would have nickel tetracarbonyl is generated from nickel bromide in the in the catalytic cycle. Uh, you need only nickel carbonyl, but you can generate it in situ from nickel dibromide and carbon monoxide. So, the repic catalytic cycle involves an oxidative addition and insertion, two insertions in fact an insertion of carbon monoxide, insertion of an acetylene and that gives you the required acrylic acid at the end if water is used in the reaction medium. Now, let us take a small detour to heterogeneous catalysis and I just mention two important industrially important reactions which have got a lot of relevance to the organometallic chemistry that we are studying. This reaction is actually the water gas shift reaction where water and carbon monoxide is converted to carbon dioxide and the extremely useful energy rich species which is hydrogen. Now, this reaction is normally carried out under heterogeneous conditions. You have a catalyst which is mostly iron supported on a copper, a copper and these reactions are surprisingly are difficult to carry out in a homogeneous conditions. So, there are practically no homogeneous analogues for these heterogeneous reactions. At catalysts like the species that I have indicated here have been used to show that these reactions can be done at least on a small scale or even if it, they are inefficient they show that such chemistry is in fact feasible. So, the reason why I, I have chosen these examples is because even though these heterogeneous reactions are really like a black box, you do not know what is going on, but still sufficient organometallic chemistry must be going on. There is sufficient organometallic chemistry that is available which shows that these reactions can be mimicked in the homogeneous scale also. So, let me give you a catalytic cycle that is possible with uh, the possible catalytic cycle written with iron pentacarbonyl. And here, if you have iron pentacarbonyl and you have um, uh, water reacting with it, let us consider it in two steps with OH minus attacking the carbon monoxide. You can have this OH minus attacking this carbon monoxide to give you uh, C O O H coordinated it is an acyl um, carboxylato anion which is coordinated to the iron and that will have a negative charge because we have added a negatively charged species. We can eliminate from this species C O 2 because you have the right groups with the right connectivity. If you eliminate C O 2 and if the hydrogen moves on to the iron 
So, that would be exactly like a beta hydride elimination. So, you would get a iron hydrido species. This iron hydrido species that we have written here can react with water and that can generate uh, if it donates a proton if it donates a proton here essentially this water is for donating a proton then you would get a dihydride this is a dihydride that we have here with the iron which can eliminate dihydrogen which can eliminate dihydrogen to give you iron pentacarbonyl back so this is a simple catalytic cycle that demonstrates the water gas shift reaction reaction although on an industrial scale scale this is not efficient so you still people still use the heterogeneous catalyst for this reaction although there is a homogeneous analog which is available although inefficient so what we have done is we have done the reverse of the you, you have done a in insertion on the carbon monoxide which has given us a hydrido species and that hydrido species gets protonated in this step with water and dihydrogen is eliminated in order to get you the iron pentacarbonyl back. So, the next reaction that I want to discuss is a Fischer Tropsch process which is again an extremely important process which is in fact uh, the key energy source for some countries especially South Africa where there is a plant it is uh, just called the Sassol plant which converts carbon monoxide and hydrogen to alkanes to products which are uh, like the petroleum products which are alkenes and alkanes and sometimes some oxygenated products are also there like alcohols and aldehydes. Now, the question is how does this reaction work? Now, carbon monoxide is reacted in the presence of a metal surface and so it is easy to imagine the metal surface as reacting with carbon monoxide to generate metal carbonyl species which can be reacted with hydrogen and get it might get converted to a methylene species and these species can couple. So, this is shown here in a pictorial fashion, but essentially what we are saying is that the metal carbonyl can undergo hydrogenation reactions or the activated hydrogen which is like a hydride can undergo migration reactions and eventually generate metal carbenes. These carbenes can couple as we have shown here if two carbenes are close together then they can couple and the coupled product can undergo an insertion reaction here is an insertion reaction and here is a coupling reaction. These are steps which we are repeatedly encountering in carbon monoxide chemistry and this is a kind of chemistry must that must be going on on the surface of the heterogeneous catalyst and this heterogeneous catalyst is a one that is efficient in generating the petroleum products. So, suffice it to say that heterogeneous catalysis is uh, very efficient and it cannot be supplanted by organometallic chemistry completely, but there are sufficient uh, enlightenment on what is going on inside the heterogeneous catalyst by studying organometallic chemistry. Now, let us go back to the carbonylation reactions that we were discussing. Now, we will talk about a palladium promoted carbonylation reaction. Now, these are extremely useful in the laboratory and I have shown for you uh, a reaction which can generate a coumarin and um, coumarins and isocoumarins are synthesized very efficiently in the laboratory using this palladium promoted. This is catalyzed by, uh, uh, by palladium and usually palladium in the zero oxidation state is what is the resting state of the catalyst, but it is generated in situ in the presence of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide efficiently reduces palladium 2 to palladium 0. So, palladium 0 is an actual uh, resting state of the catalyst. Uh, it is interesting that 
a variety of nucleophiles can be used. Uh, what we have written as NUH can be anything from alcohols or amines and this Rx could be a variety of groups. It could be vinyl, aryl and the uh, insertion reactions can happen very efficiently with uh, even complicated molecules as the one that is shown here. Let us write the catalytic cycle now to see how exactly this reaction can proceed. So, here is a reaction where you have palladium 0 as the resting state of the catalyst and that can readily do an oxidative addition reaction. So, palladium goes to palladium plus 2. This is palladium plus 2, the formal oxidation state and it has got the R and the X groups attached to the palladium which can now undergo an insertion reaction. So, for the insertion reaction, migratory insertion reaction to happen, we initially add a carbon monoxide ligand and generate this species, active species where the R group migrates on to the carbon monoxide. Once the R group migrates to the carbon monoxide, you have an acyl moiety. This acyl moiety uh, is attached to the uh, attached to the X group which came from the R X. Now, instead of doing a reductive elimination, we can have an attack by the nucleophile which we have which we want to react R X with. So, if the nucleophile attacks the attacks the carbon monoxide, the C O group of the S L moiety. So, that is the C O group. If the nucleophile attacks here, you can end up with R C O N U uh, and the N U H will give the proton to the palladium. So, this ends up generating a species which has got a hydrido palladium X group. This can eliminate H X and you regenerate palladium 0. So, this reaction is a simple reaction also. It involves a oxidative addition. So, that is this step an oxidative addition and a reductive elimination in the last step. So, the oxidative addition in fact happens between R and X. So, X has to be a good leaving group. This has to be a good leaving group and the nucleophile has to be a better nucleophile than the X group which is coming out as H X. So, as long as these conditions are satisfied and this condition is uh, satisfied for a variety of nucleophiles. If you have a halide and an amine which is coming in, then you have no problem and the triethylamine is basically a base which mops up the H X that is generated. So, at the end of the reaction E T 3 N H plus is liberated or rather the H plus that is liberated is taken up as uh, as a is converted into this N E T 3 H plus salt X minus salt and that is removed from the reaction sphere. So, you could have a direct attack of the acyl group with the nucleophile the nucleophile can also coordinate prior to the reaction to the palladium before the attack on the acyl group. So, these two possibilities are there. Uh, another reagent which is useful in the laboratory is called Coleman's reagent because Coleman developed it uh, to a great extent and this is nothing but the reaction of iron pentacarbonyl with sodium, but sodium by itself does not react with iron pentacarbonyl, but if you react it with uh, in the in the presence of benzophenone, benzophenone is like a catalyst because it generates the ketyl radical anion and this radical anion is capable of transferring the electron to iron and that results in the tetracarbonylate dianion, iron tetracarbonylate dianion which is called Coleman's reagent. 
So, this is the Coleman's reagent that we are talking about and its chemistry has been extensively studied. Because it is such a nucleophilic species, it has got a lot of electron density on the iron, lot of electron density on the iron. It can carry out nucleophilic attacks on many, many electrophilic uh, organic compounds which are electrophiles. Here we have shown two possibilities. One is R x and that will give you an alkyl ferrate carbonylate um, species alkyl iron carbonylate species or an acyl carbonylate species. So, it is also possible to convert this alkyl carbonylate species with addition of either a ligand or PPH 3 or carbon monoxide itself to the acyl carbonylate species. So, you can generate this acyl carbonylate species uh, very efficiently and this carbonylate species which is nothing but the R group with an added carbon monoxide can undergo another reaction with another electrophile. Here we have shown the reaction with R x that gives you a ketone. This gives you a ketone. So, starting with R x you have converted it into a ketone or to an acid by reaction with oxygen. In that case, the fer iron carbonylate anion is decomposed directly. Now, you can also treat it with an acid. If you treat it with an acid, you generate an aldehyde and as in the previous case, you can also react it with a good nucleophile to generate R C O N U. So, you will notice that along with addition of a nucleophile, you have managed to introduce a carbon monoxide into the molecule. So, Coleman's reagent turns out to be a useful reagent for synthesizing laboratory scale chemicals easily. I emphasize the fact that it is a laboratory reagent, not an industrial reagent because one has to use a very expensive um, uh, material in order to generate the Coleman's reagent. So, you have to use sodium and refluxing dioxane in order to generate the Coleman's reagent. Now, let us take a look at uh, an example where we have converted an, uh, an organic bromide into a cyclic molecule using Coleman's reagent. Just to illustrate the chemistry that is behind this whole process. Suppose you take this homoallylic bromide, you have if the bromine was here, then we would have called it an allylic bromide, but there is a homoallylic bromide, you have an extra CH2 group. If you treat that with the iron carbonylate species, you end up with this molecule, which is identical to this compound, although we have written an arrow here. So, these two things are identical. I have written the carbon monoxide separately. I have indicated the I have indicated the carbon an extra carbon monoxide separately because you we are now going to do a migratory insertion reaction. Now, because it is a super nucleophile, it did a simple S N 2 substitution on this carbon. So, we did an first we did an S N 2 substitution on this carbon, got the ion attached to the organic moiety. Now, this is an anionic alkyl group which is going to do a migration on to the carbon monoxide. So, if it does a migration to the carbon monoxide, you end up with an acyl species. This acyl species, it is also an anion. Remember, we started out with the dianion F F E C O 4 2 minus and we eliminated bromide. So, we are left with the mono anion that can still undergo another addition of carbon monoxide. This gives us back a iron tetracarbonyl acyl species. Now, notice that this species now has got an acyl group and this is the negatively charged 
group that is there which I have colored in red that can undergo a migratory insertion. This time the migratory insertion happens onto an olefin. Earlier we are doing just insertion reactions on carbon monoxides or in some cases we have of course, done it on an al alkyne. Now, here we are doing it on an alkene and as a result the iron will be attached to the second carbon atom. So, this is carbon atom 1, this is carbon atom 2 and the iron will be found on the second carbon atom and the migrating group is found on the first carbon atom of the alkene. So, this species which is a carbonylate anion can in fact, get, get attached to a proton and then undergo a reductive elimination step. So, this is the last step is in fact, a reductive elimination which will give you in this particular case a fairly simple molecule, but you can imagine the synthesis of a more complex structure where a pentanone is needed and that can be constructed with this chemistry with the Coleman's reagent. So, you have a, a series of migrations and insertion reaction of a carbon monoxide in order to generate this cyclic structure. <coughs> that reaction can also be done with instead of having an alkyl bromide, it can also be done on an epoxide. Now, here I have shown you another metal which is capable of carrying out this kind of chemistry and instead of the cobalt, instead of the iron dianion, now we have a sodium cobaltate, tetracarbonyl cobaltate which is going to carry out this nucleophilic attack at this position and that opens up the ring as an anion, as an ox, uh, O minus species here and in this reaction you have this neutral group carbon monoxide and an alkyl species which I have marked in red for you and this alkyl species can migrate to one of the carbon monoxides which is present on the cobalt. And if it does that and adds on a carbon monoxide, we have put we have included two steps here. One is the migration of the alkyl group and the other is addition of carbon monoxide. So, addition of carbon monoxide and migration gives you this new compound which has got o, o minus attached to an acyl moiety which is attached to the cobalt. Now, you can do an alcoholysis using ROH which means you will have the ROH attacking in this position and liberation of COCO4 minus. And this of course, gives you gives you the ester directly, an ester and an alcohol directly. So, this tells you how useful this reaction can be. You have a uh, attack of nucleophilic organometallic reagents on epoxides, halides and esters and so on. So, up to now we have not considered the coupling of two neutral ligands. In the subsequent reaction, we are going to look at how two neutral ligands can be coupled in an oxidative fashion. Now, to just to remind you, this reaction is not something new. We have discussed the coupling of two acetylene fragments on a cobalt, cobalt system, cobalt 1 to give us a, a cobalt 3 oxidatively coupled cobalt 3 species. So, this is going to be a very similar reaction. So, what we have is an oxidative coupling reaction and here is a reaction which is called the poisson kahn reaction where an acetylene, an alkene and carbon monoxide are mixed together in order to generate a cyclopentenone. In the previous reaction, in one of the previous reactions, we considered the generation of a pentanone and here the saturated form, here it is a cyclopentenone that is generated in this reaction. 
the important thing is that it is a single step, single step one pot reaction that is carried out with carbon monoxide, dicobalt octacarbonyl and two organic compounds. One is an alkene, the other is an alkyne and you end up converting all three species in one step into a cyclic pentenone and that is what we have here. In order to just show you how the reaction can be done with uh, more complex molecules. I have shown you norbonine here as an alkene. So, because it is a dinucleus species, we can imagine the dinucleus species CO2, CO8 losing two carbon monoxides and complexing with the alkene and the alkyne. One cobalt complexing to an alkene the other complexing to an alkyne. And if you do an oxidative coupling now, now you have a cobalt 0 species to start with and after the oxidative coupling, each of these metal centers would increase their oxidation state by 1 unit and you would get a cobalt 1 uh, a cluster where 2 cobalt 1 centers are adjacent to one another. And this dimetallocyclohexene which is what we have here can introduce or can insert a carbon monoxide. So, this can insert a carbon monoxide plus CO that can give you a new species which is actually a heptanone a dimetalloheptanone which can reductively eliminate. Now, reductive elimination gives us this uh, uh, this complex structure which has been stitched together in the coordination sphere of the metal. So, you can see how fairly complex reactions can be carried out in a one pot reaction. Now, it has been possible to carry out this reaction because only because the metal is capable of changing its oxidation state to plus 1 and also because the two metal centers are close enough together to stitch together these two dissimilar fragments. Now, it's, it has been shown for uh, in the case of acetylenes which are substituted with only one um, in, in on one side that they can be combined with simple acetylene to give you an aromatic ring. So, this aromatic ring can also be generated in the presence of cobalt dicarbonyl and in this case, it people have been fortunate to isolate and characterize the intermediate that is uh, being formed and this is called a flyover complex. This flyover complex is basically having the three acetylene moieties attached together on the dicobalt species. The dicobalt species is coordinated to three allylic fragments, two allylic fragments with three carbons each and you can see that this R group and this R group are coming from the two acetylenes which we have used and the central acetylene is we will mark it here with a different color so that you can see it. So, this is a this is the central acetylene that is um, that has been added and that is this that is the central acetylene that we have added and the two other substituted acetylenes are bearing the R groups and they are attached in such a way that they are as far away as possible from the central cobalt uh, cluster and so they will not be sterically congested. But now, reductive elimination from this uh, diallyl unit generates the arene selectively. So, uh, you can combine alkenes, alkynes or two alkynes together uh, along with carbon monoxide. In fact, if you treat iron pentacarbonyl with 
acetylene, simple acetylene. If you treat it with simple acetylene and carbon monoxide, it is possible to achieve the synthesis of a quinone, which is now coordinated to ion tricarbonyl. So, you can uh, generate this molecule in the coordination sphere simply by stitching together two acetylenes and carbon monoxides, two insertions, oxidative coupling of two acetylenes together and sequential insertions of carbon monoxide will give you this um, uh, quinone, which is coordinated to uh, ion tricarbonyl. So, we will end with this last example, which is the Dutz reaction. The Dutz reaction involves the combination of a vinyl carbene and an acetylene. Vinyl carbene, acetylene um, uh, can be combined together along with carbon monoxide to give you this com fairly complicated ring structure. And this is a good example, which tells you that very complex chemistries can be carried out in the press in the coordination sphere of the metal atom. So, we have a mechanism of the Dutz reaction, which is described here. We have uh, acetylene, which is coordinated to the chromium in such a fashion that you end up with a reaction, which is very similar to what happened in the metal carbene metathesis chemistry. So, you have the formation of uh, a cyclobutene, where there is a chromium on the cyclobutene ring and this now inserts carbon monoxide and that is a key step and that is indicated in green here. The inserted carbon monoxide comes from the coordination sphere of the metal and the added carbon monoxide just fills in a vacant coordination sphere. Subsequently, we can do an allylic shift of this of this group, which is attached here because it is in an allylic position. So, you can see this 1, 2 and 3 and that will give you this chromium tetracarbonyl compound, which will result in the formation of this diphenol. And on one side, you would have ether because you started out with the ether here. So, that is the group which is present here. So, these are extremely useful reactions and uh, I'll end with a dicarbonylation with which was discovered by Priyasami in, um, and that is again with iron, and that can also lead to very interesting molecules which are pictured here: cyclobutene, diones, and so on. And the double carbonylation is uh, is a reaction which has rarely been observed, and is and it is a very unique reaction that has been discovered with the use of simple iron pentacarbonyl and cuprous chloride as a catalyst. And the reaction can be modified to give a variety of substrates, which are pictured here. One example, one possible intermediate is what I have shown you on this particular screen, where iron, because it is it can dimerize, it can give you these very interesting uh, species where two ion centers can be uh, can be coordinated to the acetylene and sequentially insert carbon monoxide. So, a possible insertion mechanism for the double carbonylation is shown here in the last slide. So, the possibilities are endless and anionic species like H, R and A R can insert carbon monoxide and you can have a huge library of reactions built on the insertion of carbon monoxide.